Okay, everyone can hear me. All right, good deal. Um, I think this is actually my third talk uh, at this meetup. So I think most of you guys know me. Uh, I'm a full-time Ruby on Rails and JavaScript developer. I work on a single page application at work. And in my spare time, I produce screencasts for a website called backbonerails.com, which as the name suggests, is about screencasts for development with Backbone and Rails. So today, we're gonna talk about the controversial coffee script. Elegant in its simplicity, sublime in its complexity. So how many people here use CoffeeScript regularly? Is that it? Seriously? Like three, four people? All right, so how many people here have used it and just dislike it? A couple of people. How many people vehemently hate it? Just one? Okay, all right, all right. Well, hopefully, hopefully this is, this is good for everyone. All right, so what is CoffeeScript? Well, CoffeeScript fundamentally is, an, is an, an attempt to expose the good parts of JavaScript in a simple way. It transpiles directly into JavaScript, but it has its own set of rules, has its own opinions, and makes its own decisions about what to, what to include and what to omit. So it removes parts of JavaScript, and it adds new syntax of its own. And while debatable, I would say that overall it enhances readability and developer productivity. It does this by allowing you to more clearly express your intentions. And JavaScript in some ways, in my opinion, is kind of like a leaky abstraction, where to write code in the most optimal way, you have to jump through several awkward hoops. So in this talk, I'm going to break this into four parts. First, I'm going to talk about like an emotional assessment of why I think CoffeeScript is so controversial. All right? And from there, we're actually going to dive directly into the CoffeeScript features that make up the working parts. Um, I'll talk about some real-world experiences, what it's like working day-to-day -day with CoffeeScript, and then finally wrap up with some challenges and critiques. So let me just say, I guess I might have already mentioned, I'm a little biased because I'm very much a CoffeeScript proponent. But with that said, I still love working with JavaScript, absolutely. If I had to pick between the two, I'd rather write CoffeeScript but I'm perfectly comfortable writing JavaScript. Uh, as it stands, I've been working in CoffeeScript for about two and a half years now. Um, so while I love it, uh, not everyone feels the same way as I do. And in fact, if you ask uh, several people, you probably get very, very different responses. You'd probably hear that CoffeeScript is one of the most beautiful or ugly, loved or hated, embraced maybe even feared, and then kind of like, well, what is it? Is it a language tool? Is it just like syntax? Uh, I don't really know. But how can people have such adverse opinions from one another on this issue? How can some love it while others completely loathe it? And really before I try to answer this question, I want to take a step back. And uh, I want to just say that right now in the JavaScript landscape, we're working in the most exciting era for being a JavaScript developer at large. This is pretty much a golden age of tools. I mean, we have just a surplus of them. Uh, and they're all built to help us do our job, right? That's the primary purpose of a tool. Increase developer productivity, code maintainability, ease of use, management, and probably most of all, developer happiness. So if you really boil and compress that that's the job of a tool into the simple explanation, then when you look, well, I mean, it's, you can look at just tossing CoffeeScript in amongst all the others, right? Like CoffeeScript is just another tool like everything else is that can help, you make, help make you a better developer. It's quite simple. But, you know, I don't think that this argument really solves it for most people. If everyone just saw this as a simple tool, there probably wouldn't be as much raging going on online, the kind that's like equivalent to talking politics in public, right? Okay, so why do I think CoffeeScript is so emotionally charged? Why does it strike such a chord with people? And really, fundamentally, more than anything else, I believe the answer can be simplified down to just two things. 
CopyScript looks different, and CopyScript acts different. And if you take a step back a bit for a second, and you look at the world at large, hatred of all things really fundamentally comes from reasons no different than this. Think about that for a second. All right. Let me uh, reel the conversation back, though, something more palatable. I'm going to tell you guys a little story. So when I was a senior in high school, I started taking flight lessons because I wanted to be a pilot. It was actually in the cockpit of a Piper Warrior. And inside of there, when you're flying and learning to fly, it is absolute chaos. There's dozens of instruments and weird-looking symbols, right? There's countless checklists that you have to follow. There's always radio chatter with the, ta with the tower. There's rules and laws about airspace, and of course, plenty of turbulence when you're actually up there, right? So everything, when you're first learning, is incredibly new and totally overwhelming. It's exhausting. It's uncomfortable. I personally would become just overloaded with information. I was unable to pick out the details or discern exactly what was going on when I was there. And a younger version of me probably would have blamed it on the aircraft, right? Because that's, that's the problem. But whenever my flight instructor would take over, it all went perfectly smooth. So while we were navigating around, you know, I had to focus incredibly hard to really know what was going on. But he barely needed to glance in order to know what to do. And he called this, he used a term called pilot vision. He said that once you know what every instrument does, once you learn the rules of the aircraft, you only need to briefly scan your instrument. Your mind is able to perform tasks by rote and no longer has to focus or struggle so much. And really, at the heart of this example is the frustration and the hatred for CopyScript. But I get it. I, I really do, right? So you've been writing JavaScript since before I was born. You're a world-class expert, one of the elite. You know what everything means. You know what it's supposed to look like, and you're comfortable where you're at. When you see CopyScript, it's scary. It's intimidating, it's different, it's weird. Maybe you don't get it, but it must be CopyScript's fault. But all that is, is that you just haven't gotten, you haven't developed your pilot vision yet, right? There's actually a computer science term that describes this fundamental reaction to the situation. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And this is what leads to the spread of questionable information regarding the drawbacks of less well-known products. And that's exactly what has happened to CopyScript. And for instance, one of the more popular arguments I hear coming from misperception is that somehow CopyScript is a crutch. I mean, by its own definition, it is an attempt to expose the good parts of JavaScript in a simple way. So does that mean that you don't have to know as much JavaScript in order to be an expert? Does that mean that CopyScript is really a tool for making it easier for developers not to have to learn JavaScript? Should you just learn Java, or CopyScript before or even instead of JavaScript at all? Well, absolutely not. It doesn't even make sense. And I think really that we've been thinking about CopyScript all wrong. It's not a tool that allows you to get by. It's a tool that requires you not only to learn all of the intricate details and patterns of JavaScript, the same as everyone else, but it also requires you to learn all the rules that CopyScript has baked in. And in essence, you have to know more to use CopyScript, not less. I feel like once you start looking at it like that, looking at it under a different light, it's not a tool for news, it's not a cheap way to devalue JavaScript, nor your knowledge of it. So I think if we thought about it that way, we can all start feeling a little bit differently about it. Because there's nothing to fear. It's a wonderful tool to have at your disposal. And at the end of the day, it's just JavaScript. All right, so into the code, into the features. So before we get, begin, regardless of all the examples I'm about to show you, is that CopyScript, first and foremost, allows you to omit semicolons. You don't need them ever. Don't ever have to write commas, for the most part. You don't have to write commas when you're uh, writing properties, you can use white space, no more reference errors, that kind of thing. There's optional parentheses, so when you're invoking a function, if it has arguments, you can omit the parentheses. 
If it doesn't have arguments, of course, you still have to use a parentheses or else you would be passing a function by reference instead of invoking it. There's optional curly braces. So when you're writing object literals, passing in options, things like that, you don't have to write them. It's able to do all of this because it's white space sensitive. Um, so that means that your code is going to look extremely similar to everyone else's because there, there are coding conventions baked in. All right, so let's talk about bars. So bar is no more. Um, so I'll just start with, with a CoffeeScript example, and I'll kind of admit this is probably the worst slide out of the bunch. But basically, here we have CoffeeScript, right? And we actually have three different things. We have the count variable that we didn't have to define. We have the increment function. And then we have the total at the bottom. And what CoffeeScript is going to do is that when you define a bar, it's going to automatically be pushed up to the closest scope that the first time they appear. So in the top there in JavaScript, you have the variable declaration for count and increment. Um, but total, since it only appears in this scope, is uh, only moved up to the, the top of function, right? Um, hoisting is a big problem in uh, JavaScript, and essentially we do not have to deal with it at all in CoffeeScript. Um, the other thing, kind of subtle thing, is that CoffeeScript by nature removes shadowing a variable. Um, an example of that would be count. Since count is used uh, inside the function here, you could not redefine it to a different value than the outer one, which makes a lot of sense. It basically means that you don't have to backtrack through code uh, in order to figure out where this variable is used in two different places, which one am I working with here, and what's, what's its uh, value. That makes a lot of sense. Um, of course, the biggest reason here, uh, getting rid of var, is that it eliminates you from accidentally creating mobile variables. Not shown here, uh, what CoffeeScript does is it wraps everything uh, in an iffy, which also helps to uh, prevent uh, variables leaking up to the global scope. So you might ask, okay, the, the, really the important statement here is the rule of like 99 to 100. And if you think about bars, right, 99% of the time you do not want to make them global. You just want to make them local. So CoffeeScript's like, well, let's invert that. Let's make it to where you do not write it 99 uh, times out of 100. And that one time that you do want to make it global, just attach it to the window. It's just that simple. It's clear what your intent is, and we all move on. All right, so let's talk about object literals. And by the way, the rest of these features are all kind of like connected with where I'm going to make them a little bit more understandable. They all build off of one another, so just keep that in mind. All right, so objects, they don't really look that different. Here's, a, here's an object in JavaScript. We have our person declaration. We've got three properties, name, Toby, language, and likes an array, right? In CoffeeScript, what would that look like? It would look like this. We have optional curly braces that are omitted around uh, or the, to the assignment of the person. There's no bar. Uh, there's no semicolon. There's no commas in between the properties. Why? Because we just use white space. Had these all have been on one line, of course, we would still have to use commas. Uh, and uh, strings look the same. Arrays look the same. That, actually, arrays, there you go. It's all on one line. I could have actually split those up across multiple ones to omit the commas, but they have to be there. Not a big deal, right? All right, let's talk about functions. There are two types of functions in JavaScript, right? We have function declaration, and we have function expression. But there are pretty significant subtle differences between these two things. Um, function declaration works uh, it gets hoisted to the top, and just like bars, uh, it, it gets hoisted, but instead of just initially uh, having an undefined value, um, when it is hoisted, it can actually be executed, like it's read into memory, and it can actually be evaluated. That, that's a more proper term. So meaning that you could have function eat and you could have invoked eat above it, and it would have worked. It would have worked correctly, which is kind of mind blowing, but that is the way that it works. Expression works. Like that. <laughs> okay. <Toby. laughs> All right. So you and no one else. All right. So 
function expression works basically the way that you'd expect it to, uh, reading from top to bottom, right? Like you could not invoke int prior to it, like you know, actually being uh, expressed there. Uh, of course, as the JavaScript bars still get pointed up there, but it would retain an initial value of undefined. So if you try to invoke it, well, it, you'd actually get uh, an error because you're trying to invoke a function on undefined. All right. So in CoffeeScript, though, this is uh, this is simplified. Why? Well, you can only use function expression. Forget about declarations; they're gone. Um, we use this skinny arrow here to indicate uh, that we are creating a function. Um, and there's another subtle thing here that's going on, which is implicit returns. And in CoffeeScript, automatically the last line, no matter what, will be returned. And that kind of goes back to the 99 to 100 rule, right? Like, how many times do you just not want to return, or how many times do you want to actually return nothing from a function? Pretty rarely, many times less than when you do. Um, so does that mean that you just can't return undefined? No, you, you still can. You would just need to write return undefined or just undefined as the last line. Which clear expressing the intent of what you're, what you're trying to do, essentially. That's all, that's all that it does. So let's talk about function arguments. There's two things that are going on here. First is that arguments are, they go uh, before the arrow. As opposed to in, in uh, JavaScript, they go after the function. And that's really just a side effect of the fact that it's that's a skinny arrow. Um, and the second thing that you'll notice here is uh, CoffeeScript allows for default arguments. That's exactly what it transpiles into into JavaScript. The options is null, you set it to a empty object literal. Of course, you can set uh, any type of primitive or object as a default argument, and it works exactly the way that you would expect. Pretty straightforward. Right, so let's talk about function context. So in JavaScript, we have our person object literal, and uh, we have an eat function. Eat returns this energy equals this energy plus 10. And of course, this, the context of this would refer to person, so this would walk up and alter, mutate the uh, energy, the value of energy. Pretty straightforward. Um, in CoffeeScript, that would be written like this. And all that I'm basically showing you here is that this dot can be expressed with just an et sign. The color's not great on this, but usually like in your text editor, it's kind of the whole word would be highlighted, making it a little bit easier. You could have written this dot, or I'm sorry, et dot energy, but you can omit the period as well. So that's what, this means the same thing. Once again, you had to return um, JavaScript did not have to return from CoffeeScript because it does that by default. So as I previously mentioned, if we were to invoke this in our console, it would output 10. All right, let's talk about function binding. So we've all seen this. Uh, basically, when you have a function work, and then you need to pass a anonymous function as a callback. So this happens most often, like dealing with jQuery, dealing with a DOM click event. So we're saying when you click the element with the ID of stop, uh, call the click method and pass it in the handler. What uh, jQuery is going to do is that it is going to change the context in this callback to what it chooses. And this, the regular this, would not refer to the scope of, uh, to the context of your person. So what we typically do is something like this, we back it up, proxy it ahead of time. There are other ways to do this as well. Bar self equals this, bar underscore this. And so now we have access to this variable, this variable still retains the scope, and then we can work off of it right there. Pretty simple, um, but like, this is what I mean, we kind of have to like leak this around, kind of have to juggle these variables. You could use bind, Kind of, you know, that works, but more stuff to write. So in CoffeeScript, the second way that we can write a function is the fat arrow. And what the fat arrow does is very simple. It preserves the context that it is called in. And so now we can just write this energy because it is essentially done what has what is on the left. It's preserved the outer scope for the inner one and you're able to work with it straight away. 
Of course, you can also see here in the click, uh, I omitted parentheses. This might look a little weird at first, since it's kind of like, what, what happened to click? But these can be omitted, which means that you do, don't have to close it out or wrap it down here. Uh, so it reads a lot better. But that is exactly the same thing. That is an anonymous function right there, that, uh, that uh, fat arrow. Um, under the hood, what? Do we have a question? Just a quick question. When you are doing the examples uh, in CoffeeScript, can you like, have a tool to generate them and see how they're going to be in JavaScript? Is yeah, that... I'll do that for you on the fly. Okay. There it is. <laughs> I got it. That's it. Most of these have been that. Like, I have been, I mean, I'm sometimes showing you what it would typically look like in JavaScript, but what you're seeing here, these two examples, are identical. Like, this is what CoffeeScript would transpile into. So uh, for the most part, that's what I've been doing. Minus like maybe like like var at the top, like uh, CompScript. That's I mean it doesn't write var person. Like you know normally we write var person equals, but it puts it at the top. But no, this is it. So this is exactly what you were just asking for. Okay. So um, you can see, wow, this this looks a little bit different. This is interesting. So what is it doing? Well, it's taking it's taking our anonymous function, which was this. And it's rewrapping it in an iffy. And what it's doing is it's passing this as the argument that was the scope up here into it in here. So now inside of this function, we now have access to it. Don't we have an extra function call? <laughs> Don't we have an extra function call? It's a proxy. Do we, Toby? <laughs> okay. So. No, he, he tried to he made a joke. <laughs> um, so the, there's actually a completely different strategy than this. I was actually interested to see this. This is recently updated because it used to just do this way, like straight up, like exactly like underscore this. I was surprised to see it do this. I think that just changed in CompScript 1.7. Um, but there's actually a totally different strategy here. And when you're dealing with um, when you're dealing with instances and you have methods on their prototype that use the fat arrow, it will, instead of doing this inline here and wrapping it, it will create an underscore underscore binds function that does exactly like what underscore bind does, and it will wrap your entire function and permanently alter the context for it. But once again, it's kind of like once you understand how the fat arrow works, you just, you just it works the same way every time. All right, let's talk about function <laughs> splats. Brian, you mentioned white space, but I don't think you're explaining to anybody meaning non copy scriptures the importance of indents. But I think some people maybe. Yes, I guess, okay, that's true, that's true. So all of this, all of this is because of white space. Like I couldn't choose, like on this line, to have this in the same indention level as the three properties, right? Um, it's able to know where things close by the white space, essentially. Uh, that's a good point. I didn't think about that, but I will. I'll, I'll keep talking about that as I go. So in this example, we've got our object literal Toby. He's got no dislikes. He starts with none. And uh, but we want to give him a method called add dislikes, which, as you can see, basically just pushes into um, into that property. But what the hell are those three dots next to R's? Well, that is a splat. It works the same way as it does um, in other languages. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to write an unlimited, well, uh, the technical limit of JavaScript arguments. You can just pass a comma-separated list. Instead of passing an array, you can just comma-separate them forever. And what args is going to do is args is going to take all of those and slurp them all up, and it's going to now that args variable is a real JavaScript array. It's not that pseudo arguments array like object. It is a real array. And really, I'm using splats in two different ways. So that's like on the on the on the um, the receiving end, like of, a, of an argument to a function. And then I'm also using it in an interesting way here as an argument to the push method. And what that is doing is that there are methods like push that accept an unlimited amount of arguments. And when you have an array, you have to like do this, you have to use the apply and like invert them. But in this way, we can essentially destruct the arguments 
I'm sorry, the values in that array as arguments to push. So that's two very different ways to use it. Um, it's very clever. So how would we write this in JavaScript? So this is one of these, like, I mean, I didn't show you the exact transpiled. It's, it is essentially doing this, but I wrote what you would typically do in JavaScript to achieve this. In this first example, var args, that's how you would get args as a real array. Right? You would borrow slice from the array prototype, and you can simply do that by instantiating a new um, array there. And then you would call it with the arguments from JavaScript. And you know, I mean, look at this. Like this function here does not have any arguments, so it's like not clear that we're really accepting an unlimited amount. You kind of have to like read into the code to figure that out, as opposed to CoffeeScript. Like I see this flat, I immediately know exactly what we're doing, right? And then the second thing here is the second example where we're inverting the relationship of like arguments and arrays. Like we kind of have to do the same thing. We have to borrow push from. Uh, you know, the array prototype essentially, and then apply the context of this dislikes, and then pass the real arms array into it. So, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's like no, it's like a no-brainer, I think which one is, which one is clearer. Um, so, so yeah, there is one, one third thing a splat can do that essentially you would die writing in JavaScript. And you can, like, I have this as the only argument, but I could have had this as the second argument, and I think even the first argument. And what it would have done is essentially assign, like, it would have, if I had it as the, as the first argument, and I passed multiple arguments, then it would have basically slurped up all of them except the last one, and then reverse the other way. You could pass the first one and get that as something different, and then get the rest as the array. Um, I did not show what that looks like, so I can do it later. All right, so let's talk about ranges and, and slicing. I think I'm a little bit behind now. Thanks. So, uh, so we're going to talk about like how we do things like string slicing and array slicing, right? Uh, and ranges, right? We're talking about ranges. So in this example, right on the left, nums uh, in CoffeeScript. That's how you create a range. Uh, uh, an array of numbers, right? Uh, the two two dots is what does that. So that is the same thing as JavaScript. You could have done a for loop here, but in CoffeeScript you would essentially get that for free. Um, in this except in this second example, we're taking our existing nums, so we're like working with nums, right? And if we wanted to basically um, uh, sl uh, slice out several of their values, we can use a, in a, a range again. And notice in this range, I have three dots, and the three dots is exclusive, meaning it will exclude the last number. It will actually make it the same as 0 0.4, which is the same as other languages. right? And that's how you'd achieve that in JavaScript. That would be our output. Um, you can also do assignment. So we're basically saying, OK, well, I'm going to assign the values at the second and third index out of this uh, nums uh, array up there and assign them to negative 3 and negative 4. <coughs> Do that in JavaScript, pretty damn ugly, and we would get negative 3 and negative 4, right? Okay. And last example, uh, this is off of a string, so this is a slice on a string. Uh, we get range used the same way. So like, essentially we can do the same syntax on arrays or strings, and it does what we expect. Okay. Can those be variables? Can what be variables? Um, the numbers that you were showing. Do you want to make a, an array from 0 to x? I believe so, yes. And there's actually some other really crazy rules about like omitting one side or the other. You can do like 0 dot dot. Honestly, I cannot remember all the rules for it, but it's on the pop script. So. Um, I don't use those a lot, but they are there. All right, so let's talk about flow control. But yes, you can you can uh, you can definitely use variables. Uh, think about it. All right, so in JavaScript, we've got our object literal again. Toby's tired now, and he's got three functions: work, relax, and sleep. So let's walk through this, right? Probably not immediately clear what we're trying to say. Like, okay, so if we call the work function, well, okay, so if we're tired, we return because we don't want to work when we're tired. Else, go ahead and program JavaScript. Um, relax. Uh, 
I kind of introduced the moment JS here. So basically I'm saying if it's after 10 o'clock when we're relaxing, we call read LSTD, right? And then sleep, we're basically saying, well, sleep, uh, but if we're not tired, to go ahead and return the relax method in order to get tired, right? So in uh, CopyScript, this, um, there's a couple things going on here. So first is that we have suffix operators, such as under work, we say return if tired. Um, so there's an example of not using return at the last line, but it would still do the same thing in returning program. So we bail early <laughs> if we're tired. Uh, relax, there are no turner, ternaries in CoffeeScript. So no question mark, uh, colon. You have to write it out as English, but it reads really well. So if moment not hour, it's greater than 10, so if it's after 10, then read NTV. The subtle difference here is that this is an example of it not exactly transpiling one-to-one. -one. That is actually saying return read and return TV. Um, in fact, the way that CoffeeScript would do this is it would actually build just a regular if uh, else. Um, but it knows that if it, you did not need to return there, it would, it would write the ternary in JavaScript. All right, and then we have a new operator, unless, unless works the same way it does in other languages. It just means if not, so relax, unless tired, or relax, I probably should have written that. It would have read better, more like English, relax if not tired. You could have written it either way. So that leads us directly into operators. So everyone probably knows about JavaScript double equals and triple equals. Double equals is does loose coercion <coughs> instead of strict type checking. Sometimes the source of undesirable bugs and behavior. In CoffeeScript, there is no double equals. It is gone. The only way to write it is triple equals. And the preferred way to do it is in English as opposed to uh, triple equals, which also does not exist as actually double equals. So as confusing as it is, if you used it as English, it would just make sense. So is is the same thing as triple equals. So true is true, would be true, since those are the same type, same value. Next up we have isn't. Pretty much self-explanatory, our name isn't Randall. So that would be true. Not is the same as bang. You can still use bang, but you can also use not. So like that, I think, reads a lot better, relax, if not working. And works the same way. So we'd say exercise unless tired and sleepy. So both of those would have to be true. Else for exercise. We have or, same thing. Nothing really to see here. And then we have aliases. So. This, we just have true in JavaScript, but CoffeeScript actually has two other aliases, yes and on. All of those actually mean and will transpile into true, but they can be written in uh, more English ways that are more natural to read when you're reading expressions and stuff. Same with false, just the inverse. False, no, off. And this is my favorite operator. This alone is worth using CoffeeScript. This thing, this thing is amazing, right? I was thinking about putting like nihilism up there, but I thought no one would really get that. So, all right. So, what is the existential operator? Well, checking for the existence of a variable or a property in JavaScript is horrible, right? And so, right here we have this object literal, and we have a nested object literal address, the city state zip, with phone, and we have a, a function here, right, that returns a string. And um, so, what the existential operator allows us to do, this is like our console. If we put a question mark prior to calling a property, it does something pretty awesome. Well, so in this case, it's basically going to say, do not call city if address is null or undefined. Just fail. But in our case, city is defined, so if we call this, we get out for it, just like what we expect. The transpile JavaScript, this is what CoffeeScript does, is this. It assigns a reference to person on address, since that's like you know the parent what we're calling it on. We're basically saying if it's not null, then drill into the reference and call city on it. Else, if that failed, we would get undefined. So our second example, we have we're trying to call the property cell on phone, which as you can see, phone is not even an object; it's null. So if we did this instead of JavaScript melting down, we get undefined. 
there is other ways that we can use the existential operator, which is even more awesome. We can put it in front of a function invocation here. And what this is going to do is that this is actually going to ensure that not only that call is defined, but call is a function. So is call a function? Do we have it on person? No. So we would get undefined in the console. Not an error. Exactly what we expect. Undefined. And what that transpiles to is quite simple. Type of person dot call, triple equals function, invoke it. Else undefined. Another way that we can use the existential operator is conditional assignment, such as this. Uh, if we evaluate what's on the left, if when we evaluate what's on the left is null or undefined, do what's on the right. So once again, we use person.call. Call is not a function. It's not actually anything. So we bail and we do what's on the right. So what will we get in our console? We get bail. Super useful. Uh, we use this all the time. All the time. All right, string interpolation. It's quite kind of like in home stretch, right? So concatenating stuff in JavaScript, horrible. Makes my eyes bleed. Pluses. Dealing with white space is terrible. CoffeeScript, we can just simply wrap it with the hash curly braces, and it does exactly what it does up with. That's what uh, it would transpile to straight away. We could invoke functions. We could do anything inside the loops. It just literally splits the string, or sorry, ends the string, uses pluses, and concatenates it all together. Identical to Ruby. Now, let's talk about restructuring assignment. Also, super useful, super powerful. Um, so we have our object literal again, Toby, and the address. And if we want to extract the values out of nested objects in here, in JavaScript, it's pretty verbose. Right, our bar stuff, and then if we yeah, if we wanted to assign variables to name, energy, and address, we'd have to drill into person three different times. In CoffeeScript, this is this is a little different looking, but this is just structuring assignment. What it basically says is um, assign variables to uh, those on the left and look for equivalent property names on the object to the right. You can also do this with arrays. You can even do this multiple nested levels, so I don't recommend it. Um, this is hard to kind of see the use, but in like my screencast, I show it, and people are like instantly sold on it. I use it most often like when I have a constructor function, I have, and I pass in a set of options that are nested, and I want to be able to work with those options in lots of different ways. And instead of drilling through the object like ten different times. I would just assign them to variables straight up on the first line and instantly use them. So, super powerful. All right, so let's talk about ifies. Who can say, what does an ify stand for? Immediately invoke function. Yeah. Expression. Oh, let's got it. Three out of four. Immediately invoke function expression, or more commonly known as module pattern. What does a module pattern allow us to do? Well, we assign a immediately invoked function expression at the very top that's immediately invoked right there, right? And this gives us the ability to write private variables, private functions, and this is the reviewing mo uh, module pattern where we basically like set up like an object and return it at the end so then app can be assigned to this object. Um, how the hell do we do this in CoffeeScript, right? We don't like have this stuff down here. Could be simpler. We write do. That's it. Do. So do what? Do that anonymous function. It's the same thing. Except it's just you know cleaned up, obviously. Kind of all the curly braces and stuff. Uh, this is an example of me writing a function on one line, that private fn. You can do that just like you can write a function on one line in JavaScript. I don't do this unless it's very, very terse, but you can still do that. Object, same way, and we return function. I could have just wrote, wrote an obj down there, but I, I definitely, when I have a long function, will write the return uh, down there. It's easier to see. But if you think clever about ifies, you might think, well, what about when we have local dependencies? In situations where we have our ify here, and we want to pass in a local reference to generally global objects, but it could be anything else. So we pass in jQuery backbone, but we really want to reference them as dollar sign and db. We do this obviously because you know when, we're, when JavaScript is looking them up, if it has it you know in scope locally, it, it will resolve faster. How do we do this in, in CoffeeScript? Once again, like we don't have like this thing at the bottom. 
So I guess we just can't do it. No, I'm just kidding. So it, it could be easier. It's just the same way. That is literally the exact same thing on the line. Exact same thing. Switch case. Oh god, I really did have to hurry that down. Alright, so switch case. I don't even need to explain this. This is immediately oh yeah, well so it's switch case, but there's no case in Kong script. It's just switch. You have when, then is what you want to do, else, which is the same thing as all of this, right? It's much easier to write, um, like you don't have to remember to break or else it accidentally follow through. It's much easier to chain um, uh, multiple things that you want true, like Arizona, Utah, Nevada, else instead of default. Cool. But there is another super amazingly powerful aspect of switch cases, which is using a switch case without a control expression. What am I talking about? Look at this. This is actually, just think about how, how, how is this going to transpile? I mean, what are we switching here? We're switching nothing. And instead of like just trying to evaluate the single value of, of what we're switching, we actually have an expression here. We say this energy is less than 10, this energy is less than 20. How would we normally write this in JavaScript? Usually a big S, if, else if, else if, else if, else, and it'd be ugly and horrible. And we're like assigning this. How? How does how does CoffeeScript get away with this? Because after all, this is JavaScript. This is so brilliant. Take a look at this. This is it's assigning energy level, so it's doing returns here, right? And it's uh, wrapping this with an immediately invoked. It's wrapping this in an iffy, passing in this because because we're accessing this energy. It wouldn't have done this if we weren't using <coughs> this there. And look at this. It switches on false. Why do you think it does that? Because switch false. Is the back to the coercion stuff? Like it's it's much easier uh, to figure out false values than, than true. All right, so and look at that, and then it inverts it, but it all comes out exactly what we expect it is. And it, it is so awesome. This is super 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 useful. All right, loops and comprehensions. Usually people start with this. All right, so we have a for loop here. So we have our object properties. Likes is an array of three things. So we want to iterate on this, right? Just do a basic for loop. We would use the for in. So just forget about what in means in JavaScript for the moment. We use a for in. So in person.likes, there's the array. And then uh, the value is yielded to us as uh, this. And then we optionally receive the index by writing comma num. And so we're just logging this out using string interpolation, adding one. What does that do? And it gives us what we expect it to do. Um, and internally, this is actually doing essentially the most efficient way to write a loop in JavaScript. It's even smart enough to cache length. You know about that, right? So it doesn't have to look up the link property on each iteration. I mean, that, that's, that's it. It does, cannot get any faster than that. So performance-wise, this is essentially the most ideal way of doing it. Um, but yeah, so coming back to the for in, right? So this is how you iterate over values in an array using for in. Um, and then we have property iteration. So here we have an object literal heroes. Notice I'm using the commas here, right? I could have actually omitted those curly braces on the end and the um, the semicolon. But I guess I'm writing it in my JavaScript, but it became a little old, so all right. So in CoffeeScript, we use of of to do property iteration. So we are <coughs> splitting our object by key value, and then just assigning first to the key, last to the value, logging it out, so we get what we expect. Um, and isn't that interesting, the way that this is actually working? So now it uses uh, JavaScript's in, right? And then it assigns last, it, it knows how to basically figure out the value of that, and then you know, you're able to log this out. So who, who here has iterated on a property and then saw all these like weird additional properties in it, or things that doesn't belong to the object. Um, if that's happened to you, that's pretty usual. And CoffeeScript has a way of writing, if you wrote for own, own space first last, it would automatically wrap uh, this in uh, has own property check. So you can essentially only get the properties that belong to an object instead of the ones that uh, it receives through prototypical inheritance. Super powerful, super awesome. There's some other things about in. Um, you can use in as an index of. 
So we're saying, we're basically looking for a value inside of array. So if CoffeeScript in person dot dislikes, then hater, else friend. So we're, we're basically doing the, the array index of, but we don't have to worry about that negative one stuff. We're just asking if it does, and this will return true false. Um, the way that this transpiles, this is obviously uh, real. And you see it does this, um, this private variable index of, and it says use the one that's part of arrays. Why? Because Internet Explorer does not have index of. It also define it inline, which does what we expect it is. And then you can see how it calls it and stuff. So this is like, you know, patching older browser browsers. Comprehension. So I said the word loops and comprehension. What is a comprehension? Well, um, comprehensions, unlike for loops, can actually be returned and can be assigned. So in here, we've done like a classic CoffeeScript one-liner where we have kind of started at the right for i in a range. So we have our, uh, an array of, of uh, 100 values, 1 through 100. And then we're basically setting an object literal num i with the omitted curly braces, and we're assigning that to nums in a for loop. So what would that do? That would give us 100 objects, an array of 100 objects each with a property num and then their actual number. And it would just continue on up to 100. And uh, in JavaScript, because it knows we're actually doing an assignment, it's going to change the way that, uh, that it transpiles. Like before, in two examples ago, it just did like a normal for loop because it weren't assigning anything. And here we are, we're assigning. So it wraps it in an iffy. And notice it basically does a reduce here. Sets an empty array, loops over it like typical, pushes it into it, and returns it because we know it needs to be assigned. This is where we get the word comprehension. Loops can become comprehensions this way. Super powerful. Um, you can also use two other keywords, by and when, to do filtering or to do stepping. So like if I didn't want to increment the i by one, I could say by two, by three, and it would, it would increment it differently. When, I could put conditions on here. I could say like when i modulus two and only get, um, only get odd numbers. So what was missed? What did I not talk about? I didn't talk about blob strings. CoffeeScript has support for blob strings, which is basically you start a string, indent it with white space, it will omit all the white space. They have block regular expressions, which are super useful. They're regular expressions, a set multi line that transpiles into one single. So you can actually just read all the different changes in your regular expression. I didn't cover some of the operators, like star star, which is like math.pow. I didn't cover chain comparisons in CoffeeScript. We can say like i greater than 10, less than 20, all in one expression, and it would come out to be what you would expect it to be. Uh, trailing commas, when you're building up objects, uh, you, like in JavaScript, that last trailing comma when you end your array will blow up. Uh, CoffeeScript will just uh, slice those out. Reserved words, super useful. Can't use like class private in JavaScript. You cannot, cannot set those as properties, but you can set those if they are in the string version. CoffeeScript automatically knows what's a reserved word and will just string it so you don't have to worry about it. There's also this crazy thing about literate CoffeeScript where you actually just write it in Markdown and it's not like programming, it's like English. Just this cool thing, I've never tried it out, but it could be interesting. And I probably actually omitted the most important awesomest thing about CoffeeScript, which is like classes, inheritance, and super. I was going to say I was going to do this live because I, they're, they're so complicated, I can't come up with slides for it. I think we're over time, but whatever. So this is this gives you syntactic sugar, handles the prototypal inheritance for you, handles the surrogate functions, handles super, you get a real super call. Awesome. So um, really, though, like it's been about like like. 48 minutes, and uh, we've covered the majority of CoffeeScript. Like, it's really not that much. I mean, you if you knew JavaScript in and out, you'd probably learn CoffeeScript in a day, maybe even in a few hours, but realistically, probably probably a, a week or two. It's, it's really not that much. I mean, really, there's, there's really not that much to it. Like, there's not that many rules. All right, so let's talk about debugging. All right, so syntax errors. How how's it like debugging? Right? So in here we have a syntax error. We, we didn't write our skinny error, we wrote a plus instead. So what happens? What does it look like? Well, CoffeeScript, unlike JavaScript, if there are syntax errors, it, it explodes, it blows up on you. It will not refresh the page. 
That is it. You get syntax error unexpected compare. And like in any kind of editor, I can I just have like a shortcut that will compile whatever file I'm in in memory and would literally point exactly what the problem is. So syntax errors could not be easier to debug. Um, the second part of debugging is like logical errors. And I'm just showing an example of source maps. This is the code from some of our examples. Here's me in the debugger in Chrome in CoffeeScript. So I'm, I'm just going to move on. Uh, it's basically a solved problem. All right, here's some other tools. We have Coffee Console. I use this thing religiously. This is a Chrome plugin. And notice I'm writing my CoffeeScript on the left. I'm immediately seeing the output of JavaScript on the right. It is an indispensable learning tool. You can test things out in here. If you do have a syntax error and you don't have like a plugin and Sublime, you can copy and paste it in here. It will show you and highlight lines that are problems. Super in indispensable tool. I will just like hack and hack. Sometimes even instead of going in JSPIN, I'll just start writing things in here. Super, super, super uh, useful. Um, you can actually see like I logged out. Uh, the nums, which is kind of what we were doing earlier, and here's like my 10 objects. In, and here is the actual Chrome console below this, and I'm you know, passing it commands and stuff there. If you use Firefox, well, I, I will say there is one downside. So in Chrome, you cannot actually write CoffeeScript in the console, and that Coffee console I could, and I can execute things and see it down there, but I cannot write it here. However, in Firefox, I can. This is literally me writing CoffeeScript, hitting enter, it transpiling on the fly and getting my results. So I use both browsers at the same time, especially when debugging and stuff, because I can literally write CoffeeScript exactly. I mean, it, it, it is perfect. It is flawless. It is will give me autocomplete suggestions, all of those things. So criticisms. So let me just dispel a couple minutes. I, will, I literally have read, I don't know how many times, that there are compiler errors. So what? Because I have I have no idea what anyone's talking about. I guess I mean I'm sure this the Coxer compiler isn't perfect. There is bugs. There's I've never experienced a compiler error. It, does, it follows the same rules every single time. You're not going to just it magically do something different that one time. So that doesn't that doesn't uh, fly with me. The second the second argument to this is basically that the compilation stage does add complexity. I can't say that it doesn't. You are not writing JavaScript, but it really adds as much complexity as a linter. I mean, you have a tool running in the background, constantly checking your code, and eh, it's kind of the same thing, maybe a little bit more. Um, but really, the compilation stage is, is handled by virtually every tool and framework, server side, client side. Everything comes with CoffeeScript uh, support. It's just not a big deal at all. Um, really, it adds probably as much complexity as minification or obfuscation, like a build tool of some sort. We're pretty much working with those on a regular basis. Performance. Um, I, I have seen like actual analysis of this. CoffeeScript is basically going to perform as fast as JavaScript, if not faster, because it is going to do the most optimal way for things like loops, where you would otherwise have to use like underscore jQuery, and those are just never as fast as the actual way you do them in JavaScript. Um, so essentially, the performance argument is ridiculous. There are restrictions, but these are not like the types of restrictions that actually matter. Anything that you're restricted to in CoffeeScript probably wouldn't pass a code review anyway, but using with in JavaScript. Um, but you can do, you can express everything in CoffeeScript. You can build any app. There is, I, I would almost be willing to bet, no, no situation that would pass code review that you cannot do in CoffeeScript. So you, there are no limitations. You don't feel like you're li limited in any way, right? Hard to debug. Guess, guess we talked about this. Technically, it is, but if it's it's transpiling to JavaScript. And so it's just JavaScript, like you're just reading it just like anything else. So how can that possibly be part of any bug? Once you go into rules, it does the same thing every time. Uh, less readability, I hear this. <clears throat> I mean, I guess if you just go on and on and on for one line, it's less readable and you try to figure out what everything means, but ultimately it's going to be way more readable. We already talked about this. You cannot skip learning JS. Do not think about it, right? That I would never, ever suggest anyone. And the last, last, last thing. This is probably this is probably most amazing. This is the best title ever. Why? Because I'm about to show you something that's going to blow your mind. But I will say this line may, basically means that uh, that I'm uh, overindulging in, in this. But here's here's why I would say here's why I would say to write copy script. I'm about to show you three numbers. So who can guess what these three numbers are? 
Lines of code. All right, that's it. <laughs> lines of code. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is, this is really the last slide. These are lines of code. And this is all the code that I have written over the last year. No vendor stuff, only my own. No third party libs. No minification or obfuscation, anything like this. One caveat is this does include HTML templates, because uh, that does include some common script with ego and stuff. So yes, it is lines of code. On the left is the lines of copy script I have written. On the right is how many lines that transpiled in JavaScript. Like I said, caveats and galore. Like that is what the compiler decided to do. But that was essentially what I was able to express in CoffeeScript. So that is 2.49 times more lines of code. I have a better one though. This is this is the one. Can anyone guess what these numbers are? This is the number of characters I have written in one year. <laughs> that is the number. How many characters have I saved? I have saved 1.5 million lines of characters. So, I mean, just think about that. Think about that. Like, and and that doesn't include ships. That doesn't include typos. I mean, if you think like, you know, 15 percent of the time you're going to strike a typo, you're going to hit delete. Like, I have saved myself myself 1.5 million characters of code that I don't have to read, that I don't have to maintain, that I don't have to haul around. Like when I'm refactoring or moving things or testing, like it's just so many lines that I don't have to move up and I don't have to move down and I don't have to shift, select all these and move these up, list down. I mean, it's just, and at, the, at the end of the day, like I, I definitely know that I could write JavaScript just as well. But if you put two versions of me side by side, it is just, would be so clear and evident that the side doing coffee script would probably go about two and a quarter times faster, which is unimaginable productivity gains of potential. Stars, asterisks, take it with a grain of salt. But this is this is true. It's very misleading. Hey, I, I said I said lies, damn lies, and statistics. But these are real statistics. Pretty crazy, huh? Did you see some of the JavaScript that are generated? What? Like you showed us, like some of the JavaScript. Well, of course, of course, of course. I mean, it is going to do some extraneous, extraneous things, but I mean, it's not, it's not like. I mean, just the function keyword alone is one more function. Though. Right, right, right. Well, okay. So <laughs> that's all. I'll end now. But once I like, I got like a tool like in Sublime, uh, and I already closed it. But like in Sublime, I can just like highlight a uh, line of code <laughs> and just compile it straight there, and that's what it was in JavaScript. So initially, like I had to like maybe isolate the problem a little bit more, but not much. Uh, I mean, it is does not take much in order to start becoming very, very, very productive. So. Um, that's probably the biggest. Any, anything else? This is what I was referring to. So this is Sublime, right? I can just like arbitrarily highlight code yeah. and see what this looks like. Okay. Um, so let's say you're working in, in a, with a group of people, and some people want to use this and some don't. How does that? I don't really have an argument against that because that's back to like organizational structures and everything like that. That's really a, a different debate completely from the ramifications of using this. I, I can't I can't really comment. Like some organizations it's not gonna be a good fit, just like I'm sure any build tool or maps or anything if half the organization's on Windows. Um, but we can talk about strategies for mitigating that and stuff. Um, does it translate well both ways, I guess though? Does it translate in other words if I write JavaScript, can I get a Coffee script out of that? Yeah, I mean, there are JS2 coffee tools as well. Um, but generally, like, once you learn a couple of the rules, you can just immediately see it and know how it translates. And, and that's what I mean, like, you're not going to be able to not translate it. 
short of you doing things in JavaScript that you just probably shouldn't be doing. That wouldn't pass voter review. Um, but yeah, that, that's that is that is probably that's one of the biggest things. But that's not a problem. That's not Cobbyspin's problems. That's like an organizational problem. Right. Um, so that happens certainly. Uh, I want to throw out a book recommendation it's called Cobbyspin Restrada. Restrada. Yes. Yes. Uh, Jennifer has read that as well. That is very good. I would also recommend a little book on Cobbyspin. It's free and it's super simple. Um, copy script, so copy script. Uh, read, read, uh, read, uh, yeah. So you, you can read it for free on, on LeapHub. It just takes a couple of hours to read. And I read it like every couple of months because it, it goes, you really understand why copy script works the way it does, and you, you'll see it in the context of a functional programming language. And it's this beautiful book, and, and his other writings are quite longer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I apologize, I did not get to cover classes. Honestly, classes are really awesome to cover, but it is what it is.